With Chapter 6, we move on to bond markets. In 331, we talked about bonds, but we were primarily focused on valuing a bond and solving for yield and maturity. We will look at that a bit in this chapter, but in this class, we're more focused on how bonds trade. In Chapter 5, we talked about money markets, markets for debt securities with maturities of one year or less. Capital markets are markets for both debt and equity with maturities greater than one year. Bonds, as you'll recall, are long-term debt obligations. They're issued by both government units and corporations. When we talk about corporate debt, we mean bonds. Bond markets are obviously where bonds trade, treasuries, municipals, and corporate bonds. These two pie charts show the basic breakdown in the bond market between the two basic types of bonds. As you can see, treasuries were and still are a large part of the market, gaining in shares since 1994. Corporate bonds are still around 40% of the market, while municipal bonds have declined in market share. Let's start with treasuries, notes and bonds. We covered T-bills with money markets. Treasury notes and bonds are obviously issued by the U.S. Treasury and used to finance the government. The annual deficit is simply expenditures minus taxes collected. The national debt, which is $26.5 trillion as of June 2020, is the sum of annual deficits. These pie charts detail the composition of the national debt from 1994 to 2016. Interestingly, the T-bill share has declined from 14.9 in 94 to 8% in 2016. Treasury notes and bonds, while declining in 2000 and 2008, rose to 61.6% by 2016. Treasury notes have maturities from 1 to 10 years. Treasury bonds have maturities over 10 years, with the long bond at 30 years. Denominations are typically $1,000, but they're quoted as if par were 100. The Treasury does offer Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, TIPS. The principal value is adjusted every six months for inflation. The secondary market for Treasuries is very active. Prices are quoted as percentages of face value. Coupon rates are set at intervals of an eighth of a percent, or 0.125. Let's look at a sample Treasury quote. This bond matures on November 15, 2045. The coupon rate is 3% of face value, or $30 per year, but it's paid semi-annually. The bid price is per $100 and is the price the dealer will buy the bond from you. In this case, 107.6563 is $1,076.56. The asked price is the price the dealer will sell to you, also quoted as a percent of par. The change is the change from the closing ask price yesterday. The asked yield is the yield if purchased at the ask price. Note that the yield is the yield to call if the price is above par and the yield to maturity if it's below par. The yield calculation does use semiannual compounding. Strips are separate trading of registered interest and principal securities. These are zero coupon bonds created by separating the coupons and face value from Treasury notes and Treasury bonds. The periodic payments are separated, creating zero coupon instruments from the interest or principal payments. Strips can be used to immunize against interest rate risk. When we looked at bond prices in 331, we were actually computing what is called the clean price. When you buy a bond between interest payments, the seller is owed any interest earned up to the sell date. This is called accrued interest. The dirty price is the price including accrued interest. The clean price is the price without, the one we found in 331. This is the book's formula for the clean price of a bond. It's from this chapter. And this is from chapter 3. Relax, we're going to look at the calculator solution on a coming slide. Looking at all four versions, the basic annual payer bond formula, adjusted for semi-annual payments. Remember what has to be adjusted. The Chapter 6 formula, the Chapter 3 formula for semi-annual payers. Back to our trusty calculator solution. Remember the adjustments for semi-annual payers. Years to maturity is multiplied by 2. The yield of maturity is divided by 2. It's quoted as an APR. The annual coupon is divided by 2. Accrued interest is simply the part of the semi-annual coupon payment due to the seller. The percentage equals the number of days since the last coupon payment divided by the number of days in a coupon period. While that denominator can get complicated, leap years, etc., we aren't going to go into that and deal with it on a plain vanilla, half-year basis. Treasuries use actual days, but munis and corporates use 30-day months and a 360-day year. 
The full or the dirty price of a bond is the computed clean price plus the accrued interest, and we'll go through an example on the next slide. Suppose you buy a 6% coupon $1,000 face value bond 59 days after the last interest payment. Since settlement occurs two days later, you actually own the bond with 61 days since the last coupon. There are 121 days until the next coupon. So there are 61 plus 121 or 182 days in the coupon period. The bond's quoted clean price is 120.59375. Let's find the dirty price. Filling in the accrued interest formula. The annual coupon is $60 divided by 2. The buyer receives the coupon 61 days after the last interest payment. There are 121 days left in the coupon period. The accrued interest is 10.05. The clean price, $1,205.9375. The dirty price adds on that 1005, 1215.9875. Treasury notes and bonds are sold through auctions like the process for T-bills we looked at in Chapter 5. Two-year notes are auctioned monthly. Three, five, and ten-year notes are auctioned quarterly. All treasuries are actively traded, but primarily through brokers and dealers. Treasuries are sold through the Dutch or single-price auction process we looked at for T-bills, and we'll look at it again on the coming slides. As with T-bills, competitive bidders submit yield bids in quantity. The highest bid accepted is called the stop-out yield or the high bid. All non-competitive bidders and bidders who bid less, lower yield equals higher price, than the stop-out bid receive their full allotment. If the quantity doesn't add up exactly to the amount offered, then bidders may receive a pro rata share. Coupon rates are rounded down from the stop-out yield to the nearest one-eighth if needed. And we'll go through an example again on the upcoming slides. To begin the auction, the Fed announces the amount of treasuries being offered. In this example, we're using the $40 million again. The five competitive bidders bid an amount in dollars and a yield. Note that the lower y the yield is the higher bid. Sort of backwards. The bidders are ordered high to low, which means low to high yield. The bid quantities are accumulated to hit the offered amount. Again, this works out exactly to the offered amount, so the first three bidders get their bid amount. Compton's bid is the stop-out bid at 2.14%, which is what all winning bidders pay. Note that the negative yields can occur, but only in TIPS auctions. From our example, the stop-out bid was 2.14%. So what does that translate to in terms of a bond price? The stop-out rate is rounded to the nearest eighth, so 2.14 is about 2 and an eighth, 2.125. The semi-annual coupon, then, is 10.625. Price of the bond is determined using the 2.14 divided by 2 as the discount rate. All investors would pay 99.86561% of par. Municipal bonds are issued by state and local governments to raise funds for various projects and to just support operations. So-called munis are very attractive, especially to high tax rate investors, as the interest is tax-exempt from federal income tax and from state tax in the state of issue. General obligation bonds are just general debt backed by the credit of the issuer. Many of these are insured, which improves their credit rating. Revenue bonds are sold to finance a specific revenue-producing project, the revenue from which will be used to pay interest and pay off the bonds. But the majority of munis are revenue bonds. Due to their tax-exempt status, we need to be able to compare the return on a muni versus the return on a taxable corporate bond to determine which is the better investment. The formula shown does just that. RA is the after-tax return on a corporate bond. RB is the before-tax return on the corporate bond, and T is the marginal tax rate of the investor. Alternately, you can convert the muni rate to a tax equivalent rate, and we're going to look at an example. Given a 28% marginal tax rate, the after-tax yield on a 6% bond is 4.32%. Going the other way, the taxable equivalent of a 4.5 muni is 6.25%. Municipal bonds are offered to the public for sale in much the same way as other capital market securities, usually involving an investment bank. A firm commitment offering means the investment bank purchased the entire offering and sells it to the public. All risk involved in the sale is borne by the bank, at a price. A best efforts offering means the investment bank will make their best effort to sell the issue, but no guarantee, a lower price option. Many bond issues are sold through private placement. This generally means the entire issue 
is purchased privately by a mutual fund or a similar financial intermediary. Munis trade very infrequently, due mainly to the lack of information. Corporate bonds were our focus in 331. They are long-term debt obligations issued by corporations to finance their operations. The bond indenture is the legal document that defines the rights and obligations of buyers and issuers. Bearer bonds are not registered to the buyer. They are no longer legal in the United States, but are still issued in some countries. Bearer bonds are like cash. Whoever has them can cash them in. The IRS didn't like bearer bonds as they could not trace who was getting the interest payments. Registered bonds are just that, book entry registration to the owner. Term bonds are the most common. In a term bond issue, all bonds mature on the same day. A serial issue divides the total issue into various maturity dates spread over several years. Mortgage bonds are secured debt backed by real estate. Debentures is an old-fashioned word for uncollateralized debt. Subordinated debentures are unsecured and, in the event of bankruptcy, any proceeds to the holders will be subordinated, meaning given to whoever the bonds are subordinated to. Convertible bonds allow conversion to stock at the option of the bondholder. This combines the best of stock and bonds. If the stock's performing well, convert. If not, stick with the bond for the assured interest payments. Investors are willing to accept a lower coupon rate in return for the conversion option. Warrants are basically options to buy shares of the stock of the issuing company at a specified price. They're often combined with a bond issue as a sweetener but they can be detached and sold separately. So here's a convertible bond example. Using Tesla. Tesla's bond has a $1,000 face value and offers a conversion rate of 2.7788 shares per $1,000. This equates to a rate of 359.87 per share. Tesla's stock is currently selling for $217.87 and their current bond price is $908.97. The conversion value is the price per share times the conversion rate. So, for Tesla, this is equal to 605.417. Thus, there's no incentive to convert. Callable bonds have the opposite effect on required return. A call option is not a plus for investors, so they would demand a higher return. The value of the call option is the premium required. Some bond issues may have a sinking fund provision. This requires the issuer to retire a certain percentage of the bond issue early, usually a percentage each year. Think about the cash flows of a bond issue from the issuer perspective. They make small interest payments every six months, then they have a huge balloon payment at maturity. If there's any concern that the issuer will not be able to make that payment, then investors would require a higher coupon rate. To mitigate that, the investor could provide a sinking fund, which retires the issue over its life. While this does reduce the potential for default, it may mean the bondholder has to surrender their bond much earlier than they intended. Corporate bonds are issued in the primary market in much the same way as municipals, with the assistance of an investment banker. They trade in the secondary market in a bond division of the New York Stock Exchange and over the counter. Corporate bonds are highly illiquid, with some trading only every few weeks. Bonds are rated by several bond rating agencies, Moody's, S&P, and Fitch being the top three. Ratings specifically reflect default risk. Raters are not concerned with growth, only with the ability to repay the debt on schedule, so stability outweighs growth. This chart details the various levels of bond ratings from the three top rating agencies. The higher the bond rating, the lower the coupon rate the firm must offer. Note the lowest rating shown may be in default, payment default. Also note, bond ratings are not leading indicators, but rather tend to reflect what the market already knows. This graph shows the rates on 10-year treasuries, the medium blue line, the lowest line, AAA rated corporate bonds, the lighter blue middle line, and BAA rated corporate bonds, the black line. What to take away? The rates move pretty much together, with the lower rated debt paying higher rates. Let's look at a corporate bond quote. Issue name, symbol, and the coupon rate. Maturity date. The bond rating from each of the three major agencies. High, low, and last are closing prices quoted as a percent of par. The change from yesterday's closing price 
and the promised yield using the last price. Much like the well-known stock indexes, there are several bond indexes. They're used primarily by bond traders to evaluate various types and maturities of bonds. Bonds are issued by all levels of government as well as corporations. Government units and businesses also buy bonds as do individuals and foreign investors. Munis and corporate bonds are primarily bought by businesses. Treasuries are favored by foreign investors and governments for their safety. These pie charts detail who owns various types of bonds. Over 40% of treasuries are held by foreign investors as a safe haven. Over 55% of munis are held by businesses with 40% held by individuals for their tax-exempt status. Corporate bonds are overwhelmingly held by business. Individuals and businesses could choose foreign bonds for both the diversification benefit as well as the potential for higher returns. However, anytime you trade in a foreign market, there are additional complications. Higher political risk. Remember the crisis in Greece. A lender to a sovereign nation has very little recourse in the event of non-payment, except the threat of reputational loss and reduced access to future capital. And foreign exchange rates can move against you, wiping out any gains. Unlike the U.S., international bonds can be unregistered, bearer bonds. Many are internationally syndicated, offered in several countries, issued outside the jurisdiction of any country. Most are plain vanilla fixed-rate securities. The U.S. dollar was the currency of choice until 2004, when the euro took the lead. There are different types of international bonds. Euro bonds are long-term bonds issued outside the country of the currency in which they're denominated. The issuer chooses the currency. Euro has nothing to do with Europe or the euro currency. Denominations are usually $5,000 and $10,000. They are generally bearer bonds, and the trading is mainly in London and, interestingly, Luxembourg. Foreign bonds are different. Yankee bonds are issued in the United States and denominated in U.S. dollars, but by non-U.S. issuers. Samurai bonds are issued in Japan, denominated in yen, but by non-Japanese issuers. Bulldog bonds are issued in the United Kingdom and denominated in the pound sterling, but by non-British issuers. Finally, sovereign bonds are government-issued debt. They are typically issued in foreign currencies with the U.S. dollar and the euro leading. They are uncollateralized and reflect the risk of the issuing country. Under sovereign immunity, sovereign debt repayment cannot be forced. Remember Greece. This table recaps international debt issues from 94 to 2015. Note that the totals were rising from 2000 to 2010 when they dropped off significantly. By type of issuer. Floating rate bonds are overwhelmingly issued by financial institutions. Financial institutions also dominate straight fixed rate bonds as well. But corporations dominate in equity-related bonds. Equity-linked securities resemble both stock and bonds. They provide returns that are tied to some form of underlying equity, and the equity is normally a common stock. This means the returns are linked to the up-and-down movements of the underlying stock. And this ends Chapter 6.